Well, good morning, everybody. I too would like to acknowledge that we are gathered together on the lands of the Ngunnawal people and pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and thank them for their ongoing contribution to this beautiful national capital region. And for those of you who aren't from Canberra, are welcome. It's a big couple of days. We have, of course, the, the US president visiting sometime today, and you may have seen the helicopters flying around the place this morning, checking this all out. Um, as many of you know, I've been deeply interested in government technology policy for many, many years now. Um, as you've heard, I was elected back in 1996 and came to Parliament uh, very enthusiastic about the potential for change that the internet would bring about in both our society and economy. Um, I was really surprised to find out that not too many colleagues at that time um, knew what the internet was, and there wasn't the kind of conversation that I expected in the federal parliament. Um, needless to say, there's been progress. Um, it's not so unusual now, of course, for everyone to not only understand uh, the, um, the potential of the internet, but of course as politicians and parliamentarians uh, to be avid users of the technology. So we've come far in even the short period of time um, that I've been around. Um, I have been on a lot of those committees. I, I can say, not over, not over the last couple of years in my portfolio responsibilities, um, but certainly it was a transformative period um, right through the late 90s and the last decade uh, as the discussion about technology and its impact on everything, sitting at the heart of, of businesses, of the way we do government and the way we do business. And we arrive at this point in the 21st century able to fully acknowledge the role that technology plays in transforming our democracy itself. When it comes to open government, um, th there's a saying, and you would have heard it, sunlight is uh, the best disinfectant. Um, and the acknowledged strength of transparent and accountable government in underpinning a strong democracy is undeniable. It's certainly a philosophy that this government subscribes to, and our efforts with regard to transparency and openness continue. I've often said that it will be the governments around the world that understand the relationship between openness and transparency and the strength and robustness of their democracy that will be the, the leaders, the true leaders of the 21st century. And I believe that the technology is demonstrating the benefits. Um, crowdsourcing, tapping into the wisdom of the population and putting it to good use. Uh, augmenting uh, policy consultation and the thought leadership that emanates uh, from the whole community, I think is a, an incredible strength. Um, in my office, uh, again, thank you in the introduction, uh, acknowledging the Public Sphere event, and I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge um, the person I collaborate with on these things, and that's Pia War. Yay. I've been... <laughs> <laughs> It's always, it's always been a, a team effort, and I think um, the strength, the great strength that she brings to my office, you're familiar with in the work that she did prior uh, to uh, coming across to my office, but she continues to be a genuine leader and a true partner in many of these initiatives. Uh, good geospatial data means the government can tailor uh, local policy solutions for, and programs for particular areas. Geospatial also allows for more layers of data visualisation, turning data into information and information into genuine knowledge and greater understanding. All of these tools are starting to proliferate in a way, and I'm heading after this conference over to the Geospatial at Gov conference to talk about the role that spatial, the spatial industries and their intersection with government policy play in this exciting future as well. Um, for a couple of examples there, my school, your health, my region, they're all empowering citizens to take an interest in their community and what is going on around them. They provide tools that um, make the data that government has always held in the custodianship of uh, for citizens available to people to use in a practical way. These things aren't necessarily without their controversy, but it's a, it demonstrates a new way of thinking where governments give meaning and, and uh, structure around information that is useful for citizens to use in their day-to-day -day lives. I think these initiatives are often underestimated in the uh, uh, conversation, the national conversation about open 
uh, open government and I'd like to acknowledge them today. But we do need to go further in the quest for open government and one of the great challenges is the collaboration that occurs across government and across spheres of government. When you think about it, governments are still built in the structures of the turn of the, the last century, um, in fact the, the century before that, when <laughs> federation itself uh, was formed, um, we had an economy and a society that was reflected in the way that governments uh, were, were structured and built. Are they still relevant uh, in this day and age is a very live question and when you look at the efforts this government has made in utilising the strengths provided through the Council of Australian Governments or COAG and the introduction and, and pulling in of local government into that national conversation, you start to get a sense of the challenge of what our government structures do in determining uh, the nature of policy and program delivery. And the key is really collaboration. Uh, the work we're doing with COAG is about collaborating between the different spheres of government, local, state and federal. Um, all of these uh, spheres of government need to, to work together. We don't need, I think, to get rid of, as some advocates would say, the states. It's a, often a common throwback. But it is about collaboration and working effectively together. Um, this is also true for citizens, um, citizens' government and business. There are so many great opportunities for public engagement across uh, the different groups in our society. I think that, again, a test of true democratic relevance down the track will be how these conversations are facilitated and how valued uh, the, the results of those conversations are by governments of the day. This is an area where the FOSS community has been showing how it can be done, I think, for, for well over 30 years. Um, there are many lessons of community development, co-design, meritocracies and how to respectively and constructively herd cats. All of these learnings are broadly relevant to government and society as we seek to make government processes more open, more transparent and more collaborative in their character. Open government, which is also loosely termed as Gov 2.0, represents a substantial shift in the culture and practices of government to be more open, engaging and responsive as citizens. And I'm really proud to be part of a government that has made such substantive um, progress in this area. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time now outlining some of that progress um, last year, the government, Australian government released the Declaration of Open Government. It's a huge step for open government policy and vision in Australia because, of course, it's the, it's the political leadership expressing a vision for where we think this area of policy needs to go. I won't read the whole declaration. I'll make sure when I post this speech it's got all of the appropriate links. But I do want to read the first few paragraphs. The declaration reads, the Australian government now declares that in order to promote greater participation in Australia's democracy, it is committed to open government based on a culture of engagement, built on better access and use of government held information and sustained by the innovative use of technology. Citizen collaboration in policy and service delivery design will enhance the processes of government and improve the outcomes sought. Collaboration with citizens is to be enabled and encouraged. Agencies are to reduce barriers to online engagement, undertake social networking, crowdsourcing and online collaboration projects and support online engagement by employees in accordance with the Australian Public Service Commission guidelines. The possibilities for open government depend on the innovative use of, that new, of new internet-based technologies and agencies are to develop policies that support employee-initiated innovative Gov 2.0 based proposals. So you start to get a taste of how uh, important this statement is in providing the political leadership and therefore momentum to agencies and departments across the Commonwealth and I'm very proud of it. It does go on, it's all relevant and I do um, encourage you to visit that link if you haven't already. Ladies and gentlemen, I've often described open government as having uh, three pillars, uh, which nicely, I think, enc encapsulate um, the different practical aspects of, of open government. Um, these are democratising data, 
participatory government and citizen-centric services. Uh, it's about opening up government information and data for transparency and democratising data. Um, it's about ensuring that there are opportunities for genuine interaction and feedback uh, using the tools, so the participating uh, participatory government. And I'm not talking about social media in the PR marketing area of uh, agencies. Um, this is something very different. That's all going to happen anyway, but this is about genuine engagement, not another channel for marketing. It's a very important distinction. Uh, and finally, um, citizen-centric services. You know, I don't think people really care which sphere of government is delivering what they need. I don't think they particularly care which department is doing it. That, that's our concern. We need to worry about that as administrators and policy makers and legislators. Um, what citizens care about is that it's easy to access. And what, what greater vision can we have than to use the power of technology and software that we, we know is, is there to make that uh, access to services genuinely focused on the needs of the citizen, of the family or of the community. And I believe we, we, do, have, we do have the technology to make this possible and there are some wonderful initiatives taking place, including um, the, the work done through australia.gov.au uh, to try and make this seamless presentation of services to citizens. Um, we have a whole raft of, of policies um, that place principles at the heart of citizen-centric uh, uh, citizen service delivery and I think that we have still some way to go in developing the, the interfaces that, that will make that real for people. I'd love, I love the idea of, of um, um, a, a citizen being able to put in how, as if, however much information they would like. Maybe they don't want to put any personal information in and that's okay. But just describe their life circumstance, their geographic location and then have served back to them all of the, the possibilities of support services available right down to where the local Medicare office is. That's already available right down to the details and qualities of their local schools, that's already available, um, right down to um, the um, potential um, um, uh, health advice for their particular station in life, um, all of these kinds of things. We're getting there in, in a, um, um, different blocks of information but I still think there's great potential to bring it all together. There are new ways of administering government and delivering programs, um, as I said, that are being developed, but I don't think it can be forgotten that the open source tools themselves, born of the methodology that is now itself changing the character of our democracy for the better, still thrives within government itself. In the search for innovation, to be smarter about service delivery and maximise efficiency, open source software has all those attributes. Government IT vendors have long built their margins around proprietary IP and prescriptive scope, but I believe the folly of this is exposed with tight budgets and the results being little or no innovation able to be expressed or delivered through those contracts. Um, open source solutions and e even highly commercial products and services share the characteristics of being dynamic within the market space, forced by definition to respond to opportunities and advancements. And this is a good dynamic for, for government. It helps government be a sophisticated purchaser of technology and demands engagement in the decision-making levels. Um, with IT sitting at the heart, as I said, of business operations in the 21st century, the passive purchase of cookie-cutter solutions are no longer an option for businesses that need to adapt, A, to a high bandwidth future and B, one where the, the tools that are now becoming available online and in the cloud are changing the way we communicate with each other, both in, within organisations and outward facing. We are a country of the earliest, one of the groups of the earliest adopters of new technology in the world. When you combine that with the prospect of being one of the only Western democracies, that will have a universal high bandwidth network in the foreseeable future through our policies with the National Broadband Network, it starts to look like a remarkable confluence of opportunity. 
The relevance uh, of FOSS um, that is extremely apparent to me through many years of tracking the progress of technology and related government policies is that openness um, continues to be and, and is a stronger, stronger than ever foundation for innovation, collaboration and, and finding sustainable approaches to solving problems. Um, back in 2008, my uh, office ran a consultation called the Foundations of Open Technology and Digital Knowledge. This was um, back then a contribution to the local summit program um, running off the very analogue 2020 summit at the time. Um, Pia and I uh, worked out a format and introduced some online components with the support, I have to say, the wonderful support of Tom Worthington, the adjunct senior lecturer at the Australian National University. Tom and I co-chaired the event and it was held just across the road here at um, CSIT. Um, we had Dr Andrew Tridgell speaking, Jessica Coates from Creative Commons, uh, Jeff Waugh, Tony Hill from the Internet Society, Alan Smart from the Spatial Information Industry Association, he now chairs the Spatial Industries Business Association of Australia and of course Tom Worthington himself amongst others. Um, this consultation was part, I think, of a continuum of events that highlight the impact of the free and open source movement has had on the understanding of the benefits <laughs> of free and open culture to innovation. Um, I can't under, you know, I, I can't overstate it enough about the important contribution FOSS has made to that open knowledge agenda. Uh, with case studies like Wikipedia and the emerging open biotech communities, we're starting to see these philosophies inform the mainstream. At the same time, the rapid growth of social media and online tools that foster collaboration, um, it's a democratisation of that open source methodology. Um, and we're entering a new era of public engagement and democratic em empowerment on the back of it. Um, what makes the FOSS approach so special? Well, you're probably all in a position to tell me, but I'll tell you what I think. People who, as people who are passionate about your craft, it's natural you care most about getting the best possible results. And the best results come through collaboration, applying many minds and different ideas to a problem and coming out with something far greater than the sum of its parts. Um, good collaboration requires openness to be genuinely successful. Um, participants all need to be empowered, um, open accessible tools and platforms for contributions to be received and shared. Um, the people involved need to feel like they're contributing to something worthwhile um, and that means understanding um, what is trying to be achieved, where the end point is and what, what is the value proposition for their contribution of time and intellect to that task and to be recognised um, for those efforts. Uh, again, an open approach is where um, that good old peer review, everyone can see the contribution everyone else is making and people are genuinely valued for their specific contribution. There are a few games that can be played in open environments in this way. This early developer ethos um, uh, <coughs> laid the groundwork for FOSS and for the open knowledge and free, free culture movements and now even the open government movement and I'd like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the many free and open source culture and society advocates everywhere. Um, your leadership and vision is contributing substantially towards a more open and collaborative society. Likewise, an open approach to technology is vital in ensuring the capacity exists for individuals to collaborate and to share their information and ideas and to ensure those, all those practical things like interoperability between systems so we can access legacy data over time. There's a whole list of, of sort of open standards um, points that I like to make and uh, again I'll, I'll provide a link to them rather than go through them here but open standard formats is like an insurance policy uh, for our digital history and for accessing information uh, generated in the past. Um, one of, the, one of the aspects of, of whole of government information policy, um, and I, I do note that the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner had their inaugural conference um, just this week, um, is, is the character of how information policy is developing across the whole of government. Um, there is leadership uh, coming from that office in many respects. It's tightly 
associated with the administration of the Freedom of Information and Privacy Acts and laws and reforms that have been put into place. Um, but one of the areas where I think I find myself continually advocating is on the area of public engagement. Um, imagine how much we could achieve if our public servants were able to engage uh, more fully online with citizens in the delivery of service. Um, I think the citizens have chosen where they want to be and it's on Facebook, it's on Twitter, it's on all of these tools that are available um, in the cloud and we need to recognise and acknowledge um, that if we're going to be effective service deliverers we need to go where the citizens are. Um, I've mentioned public sphere a couple of times now um, but one of the points I wanted to make about the public sphere is that its strength was in the applied use of uh, social networks to host that conversation. Public sphere used existing social networking tools. There was no build. It was a nice tweaking up of WordPress and then using um, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and, and other very you know, widely used tools to capture that conversation. Um, the public sphere I think uh, was recognised uh, because of this. Um, it didn't require um, a, a budget or a line item uh, emanating from anywhere. In fact, the first three were hosted, as I mentioned, from my office as a backbencher in government and to the great credit of, um, of PIA and of a, a substantial team of committed volunteers who were able to deliver and capture a policy conversation and feed that into a substantive um, exercise being conducted by ministers on each of the topic about that policy area. Um, the other uh, point I want to make about public sphere is that it had a beginning, a middle and an end and you could participate in that conversation in fully digital form through the live feed and the social networking tools or in totally analogue form by writing a letter and we would scan that in, it would form part of the data set. And finally, just on public sphere, its great strength was its full transparency. There was nothing we did that wasn't completely open. There are a few steps where we as an office had to make the first iteration, for example, of the report. But by placing it on a wiki and then an open ranking system of the ideas and recommendations that came out, it was able to be um, completely in the public domain. It did attract quite a bit of interest. Um, companies such as Palantir, um, used the data set to run their network analysis tool through which was fantastic and really I think instructive in um, um, the sorts of tools available to um, validate the kind of outcomes that we were um, forming in our own minds based on the input and secondly some sentiment analysis tools all of which is you know, relatively new technology but has an important place um, for validating um, the quality of the conversations that can occur using social networking tools in such an open and transparent way. All of the public spheres, both the policy outcomes and the um, event methodology are published on my website for your reference. There's a couple of other things I'd like to mention before I conclude. Um, open data uh, generally, uh, making public sector information open, accessible and reusable. This occurs through data.gov.au which was launched back on the 10th of March of this year. Um, there is input from all jurisdictions of government um, featuring, including um, 455 data sets from Australian government agencies, 82 data sets from New South Wales, including air transport regional passenger stats from Sydney Airport and the New South Wales Fire Brigade's annual statistical reports, average electricity use and live traffic cameras, just to name a few. 118 data sets from Victoria including arts festivals, athletics, gardens and reserves and the collections of the museums of Victoria um, as examples and 26 from the ACT. Um, the Australian Government Information Management Office or AGMO is working with the ACT government to help them use data.gov and GovSpace to create their own ACT government data portal. Um, the uptake of Web2, Web2 technologies is increasing quickly and there are now 369 Australian government RSS feeds and 102 government Twitter accounts. That's progress. <laughs> um, <laughs> open government policy in Australia. Um, I uh, spoke earlier about the foundations of Open Summit back in 2008. Um, prior to the Gov 2.0 and open government push in Australia, 
and I've, I've said in a follow-up speech, an open philosophy could benefit Australia by providing the foundations for innovation in digital knowledge and open technology. So I can, can I say it's been extremely satisfying to see that sentiment reflected so strongly in government policy, particularly through the Gov 2.0 task force report and the ahead of the game report. This was the blueprint for the future of the public service in Australia. It was quite critical in addressing some of the workforce issues associated with the challenge at hand. It's very easy to um, you know, talk in, in, in broad policy terms and, and as far as a vision of Gov 2.0. It's another to make um, that really happen on the ground and that's why I'd like, I often uh, and like to bring up the ahead of the game report and credit the Chair Terry Moran for his investment of time and intellect in getting those settings right. Now, both papers have a very strong focus on consultation, collaboration, open data, public engagement, greater <coughs> transparency and cultural and attitudinal change required to accompany those significant changes. Other relevant policy developments include the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, Principles on the Open Public Sector Information. It comes on a beautiful glossy card which I picked up at their conference yesterday. Um, but these principles, very quickly, open access to information being the default position of the Australian government. So unless there's privacy, security, good legal reasons that can be demonstrated, that is the default position. Principle two, engaging the community. Three, effective information governance. Four, robust information asset management. Five, discoverable and usable information. Six, clear reuse rights. Seven, appropriate charging for access. And eight, transparent inquiry and complaints processes. Um, they've made terrific progress in the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. Again, I'll put the full links on my, on my speech. Um, the, uh, in recognition of a more mature open source market, um, the Australian Government Information Management Office, AGIMO, released the open source software policy for Australian government in January of 2011 and the Australian Government Guide to Open Source Software um, v2.0 in July of this year. Um, the Guide to Open Source Software for Australian Government Agencies provides an introduction to open source. It, it includes background information on the benefits and risks of using, modifying, distributing and developing open source software and guidance to assist <coughs> agencies to understand, analyse, plan and deploy open source software. The core principles are these. Principle one, the Australian Government ICT procurement processes must actively and fairly consider all types of available software. Principle two, suppliers must consider all types of available software when dealing with government agencies. And three, Australian government agencies will actively participate in open source software communities and contribute back where appropriate. Of course, the capacities for government to innovate in this area is directly related to technology procurement policies. Um, so how many of you know that as of January 2011, all government agencies are required to consider open source um, software as part of their technology procurement process? Um, with the second version of the guide released in July this year, um, this was far more comprehensive. Um, as of March 2011, all of the Financial Management and Accountability Act agencies were required to implement these principles to actively consider open source software as part of any procurement. And um, over 50 Australian government agencies reported the use of open source software within their agency, comprising of over 750 open source implementations. These are impressive statistics. And early this year, Ajimo, um, sorry, early next year, Ajimo will be surveying agencies to identify how effective the change in policy has been in increasing the use of open source software. Um, it's been used in many platforms within the Australian government, including Windows, Sun, Solaris, Linux, Unix and Mac. Examples include web platforms such as Apache, um, operated by the Bureau of Met, um, operating systems such as Red Hat uh, Linux used by the ATO and geospatial applications such as Google Earth used by the ABS, just examples. Um, one product widely used in the geospatial area is GeoNetwork which provides a, um, a web interface to search geospatial data across multiple catalogues. Um, and this tool has been developed by participants from a number of international agencies 
and released into the community for anyone with an interest in geospatial data to use. And it can produce data that is compliant with the ANSLIC metadata standards. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I felt it important to run through um, those specific developments and um, statistical snapshot of the use of open source in the Australian government. But I'd like to conclude on, on these points. The open government agenda around the world has been built on the back of, of open technologies, open standards, open data, and is informed um, by these things. Australia is no different. Open technologies like open source, open standards, open data all create greater interoperability, far greater opportunities for collaboration and um, greater transparency and therefore accountability in government. Um, it's worth mentioning at this point there will be challenges implementing open government. Nothing is a smooth or easy journey in my experience and um, many issues around implementation and culture change. I advocate seizing the opportunities for innovation where they present themselves and often it's the champions sitting within the public service or within private industry that take that first step, perhaps against the odds, perhaps having to argue the toss with their, with their boss. But those steps are the ones that make the difference because many small steps um, show that leadership and inspire others. And uh, conferences like this, uh, and I've attended many on the issue of Gov 2.0 and open government, um, start to build and, and <coughs> contribute to that important momentum. Um, with the policy leadership that is present uh, in this space, as I've been through today, uh, there, is, there is the leadership that people often say is lacking. Well, on this issue, it's there. It's been there for, since our, open, uh, our statement, our charter on open government, and it's certainly there with the celebration and acknowledgement of the Gov 2.0 initiatives that are giving it form and substance. At the same time, we're taking care to leverage the benefits of open standards, of improving collaboration through spheres of government and across agencies. Every individual has a role to play in progressing this agenda. I'd like to finish by acknowledging some of my colleagues uh, in, in the political world who've contributed significantly to this, uh, predominantly Senator John Faulkner. Um, his stewardship of the changes to the Freedom of Information and the Office of Information Commissioner have been extremely important ones at the statutory level and putting in place the, um, the vision and philosophy behind openness being uh, a tool for strengthening our democratic processes but also Lindsay Tanner, whose stewardship of the Gov 2.0 task force and the issuing of the Charter of Open Government. Um, subsequent ministers, uh, Mr. Uh, Minister Joe Ludwig, and now Minister Gary Gray, uh, as Special Minister of State, has stewardship over AGMO and other aspect, important aspects of whole of government information policy. All of these people are playing a significant role and I'm proud to be part of their team. Um, I'd like to um, also, in concluding, once again acknowledge Pia War for her substantial contribution um, through my office and through her general advocacy. Um, the open government agenda is moving, when you think about it, at quite an extraordinary rate. It's not perfect and there'll be some aspects of it that appear inconsistent across other areas of government, but can I, I can assure you that as we deal with each of these challenges, we are on a trajectory that augurs very well for an open, transparent, engaged, truly collaborative future democracy in this country. Thank you so much for listening. All right, before Senator Lundy leaves, does anyone have any questions for the Senator? Hmm. Um, I don't get a lot of pushback. I think in the political debate and advocacy, this isn't an area where there's a great deal of um, controversy. Every now and again, I hear um, supporting, supportive statements or acknowledgements from the other side of politics. Um, but the character of the debate tends to manifest itself around very prosaic issues. For example, there's, um, you know, 
an issue about a Gov 2.0 initiative or, or, or something that gets picked apart at Senate estimates. So I'm not seeing any expression of broad leadership across this. And most of the, the political debate is, um, well, you said you would do this and you haven't yet. What about it? But it's not accompanied by the expression of a broad vision in the way that I think we've done it. Um, I don't apologise for making that partisan comment. I think that's exactly how it is. Um, the other, the other <coughs> aspect of um, um, you know that bipartisan support is that sometimes it comes from from interesting quarters. And I, uh, geospatial is a, is a, a, an area, and I'm a former member of. Um, the Parliament, uh, a Liberal, Gary Nairn, for example, is now the Vice President of the Spatial Information Business, Spatial Industries Business Association. So there have been individuals from time to time in a, in a bipartisan way or in a cross-party way that have, in their particular field, um, he was a surveyor by trade, um, have found their way to be advocates of, of openness in that regard. So just to be fair. Yeah. I guess how, my question is how can we uh, as, as program officers, staff members, and also how can the government reach out and say, we're actually trying to do the right thing here, like come and engage with us, it's fun. Yeah. Um, look, that's a, a great point. You know, I don't need to tell you, you guys about the level of cynicism towards politi <laughs> political agendas. Um, th there's a point at which cynicism becomes a, a, a channel in itself. And what I ask of people is to, to have a look at the policy substance and, and what we're actually delivering. There's so much, what, what I've found through crowdsourcing and, and public spheres and the engagement we've done is if you do it in a genuine way and are able to demonstrate through action, not just words, the genuine character of what you're trying to achieve, then you earn respect. It takes time, it's piecemeal, but each person that you earn that respect from hopefully spreads the word. You know, it's like the, the Gandhi saying, it's, you know, be the change you want to see. This is my philosophy in my work and I hope that um, by demonstrating through our actions we're able to, to break down that level of cynicism. Um, as individuals yourselves, you are uh, the builders of the tools that make these things possible. But you're also individual activists and citizens in your own right. And there's a wonderful role that you play and have played in being open and genuine participants in the very conversations themselves. And don't underestimate the strength of leading by example on the character of that participation. And this goes back to that, you know, the, the culture of the open source community, which is you just get in there and give your best uh, in a very open environment, in a very un um, um, self-conscious way. Um, these are great attributes of a, of a healthy democracy and it's one of the great attributes that I think you bring as a community to the kinds of conversations that we hope to engage with with government. We're not going to get it right every single time. There are going to be mistakes and we'll get take a step back from time to time. But I think, as I said, the trajectory, trajectory is very positive um, but it does require an enormous amount of goodwill. Goodwill that I found is absolutely there and there's some great crowdsourcing initiatives across government which shows people would like to contribute to the public good. Here is the technology that facilitates that for the first time and getting that right is one of the things I focus on as I talk about Gov 2.0, so thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, um, thank you very much, that was a great speech. Uh, is there any discussion or strategy uh, sort of in the mainstream in government around the procurement process for solutions because as much as uh, Edgemo sort of put a document out saying that you know, open source solutions have to be considered, a lot of the tender documents that come out of government are really mm -hmm. not really, they're very much written with a product in mind that fits the sort of product yes. model a lot more. And is there, is there a strategy around going to like saying when you're writing this tender document, you know, don't ask who owns the product, you know, or sort of understand that 
Because some of these questions are really loaded in the sense that, well, there's not really a right answer if you're coming at it with a lost solution. Yeah. Any sort of thoughts around that? Yeah, look, fantastic question. And age old, um, I don't know if any of you know, but in my years in opposition, I spent probably eight picking apart the procurement practices of the former government for all of all of these kinds of reasons. One of the things we've done since coming to government is put in place an IT supplier advocate within the Department of Innovation, Industry, Science and Research, which will take the problems of the, the, the vendor community, particularly the smaller uh, innovative companies who are trying to um, you know, crack the government market for the first time, and then work with the Department of Finance and agencies to break down specific barriers that businesses perceive in the procurement process. So we've got a, a channel to progress that. I'll make sure I put a link in for the IT supplier advocate in that regard. But really the policy outlined about giving direction to agencies to consider open source is the first substantive step in that, that general conversation. I still think there is a predisposition um, in many agencies to go to their default, um, what they understand and know. And they, the, the huge challenge right now is that's all changing. It's changing for two reasons. One, the, the kind of solutions that will deliver outcomes don't look like that anymore. They don't look like big mainframes with server farms running off it with data sets that may or may not be added to efficiently over time and then that information is used internally. In a, in a paradigm of open, of open government, there's a different way of managing all of that that data right in the very first instance. So the two, the two sort of policy discussions intersect. But the other one is the availability of a universal high bandwidth network and that changes everything too about the compelling ways in which government can serve citizens. So I think they're all <coughs> intersecting but the guidelines, perhaps look at those, um, the revamping of the guidelines from June this year and also the IT supplier advocate in, in stepping up to your cause to start to challenge some of those systemic barriers in the tender documentation. Uh, I think we have time for about two more questions, so you have your hands up before. Yeah, um, again, excellent question. Um, I come from the building industry where there's less than 1% of women. <laughs> so coming into IT and I see the same, the percentages are far higher, but the same character of the challenge and that is the perception of the industry, just looking at the um, sort of supply side for a moment and what we can do to encourage um, particularly young women but also women of all ages to contemplate a career change into ICT. Um, there's, there's one pitch which says, ICT is not about tech, <laughs> um, which is one angle because people are intimidated by that. But the other one, and this is really important, is the great appeal of, of being um, completely capable in, in the, the genuine tech area and, and the thrill and excitement of a career in that area too. Um, I think this is an area where we have um, quite a bit to go. It's not without a huge effort on behalf of role models. I know many women uh, who have played the role of um, chief role model in speaking to young women. I have a personal theory that you need to get to them really, really young. Um, I formed my views and I remember um, in fourth grade about what I would do and what I wouldn't do and I stuck to those, to those things. But I formed that view in fourth grade. All of our careers awareness starts in about year eight, year nine. And that's considered relatively early. The most comprehensive career um, advice and development starts in year 11, 12. So I think we can do a lot more um, taking care in the perception we give about sectors and industries and the possibility for greater gender equality across them in very early years of a child's development of their perceptions about those careers. So I'm, needless to say, I'm patron of a program taking building industry trade awareness into a primary school. <laughs> which was my primary school, so it's pretty special to me. Um, but it's very early days in that kind of thinking. Uh, we, can, we can do a lot more. Um, I, I'm at a loss as to why it doesn't have more appeal to young women and the government will be heavily reliant on the role models that can take that message out. One last question, anyone from this side? Yeah. Uh, in relation to um, IT development, um, Thank you. 
Yes. Yeah, look, one of them is really about um, the celebration and promotion of success. Um, we initiated the um, Gov 2.0 showcase, which has been picked up, I think, ultimately by, um, by DUSERA, by the Department of Innovation, to host just a series of 10-minute um, vid presentations that encapsulate really interesting Gov 2.0 ideas as one example. But there, there's now a growing sort of awards and recognition program for excellence. <sighs> Um, can I tell you, you're right to mention councils too because some of the greatest and strongest innovations in this country have occurred at council level. But the fact of the matter is that it's the, it's the councils in growth areas that have the capacity and revenues to be able to drive that level of innovation and seek their own efficiencies that are the most successful. So how do we share that knowledge and experience? It really comes down to that magic word collaboration and us, what, what settings do we need to put in place to allow those councils or different spheres of government agencies and departments to work to work together and, and progress things. Um, I'm getting great feedback about where that is occurring. Um, it doesn't occur everywhere, but this is not something that's going to be top down. Um, the, the policy leadership's already there. It, it really has to promote, support, share the success stories where they're occurring and help um, just drive that, that culture of perpetual innovation in Gov 2.0 to allow it to proliferate. I think the MBN generally will be great impetus to look at the digital tools available to um, um, facilitate um, society and engagement. Um, and I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite optimistic that that will gather momentum as, as the rollout continues the pace. It's very early days, remember. There aren't too many areas um, that have rolled out, but the, the construction program is now being announced systematically by MBN Co. So I think that will help. All right, I think you'll all join me in thanking Santa London. <laughs> Is it alive? No, it's not alive. I, I must apologise, geeks are not known for their rapping prowess, but. <laughs> as long as I get a piece of food, thank you so much. I'm sorry I have to go. Um, have a great day. Well, there's um, biscuits and morning tea out the front if you'd like to start helping yourselves. <laughs>